Welcome to episode negative 8 of Successful Demo. Each episode analyzes the theoretical and practical aspects of one or more existing cards. Today we'll be looking at R&D Interface. R&D Interface is a card that allows you to access one additional card every time you access cards from R&D. This is a good card because the more cards you access from R&D, the more agendas you will most likely access, and the more agendas you access, the higher your chances are of winning the game because to win the game, you need to score 7 agenda points. Now, let's watch this card in action. So, our opponent is running the Harmony MadTech Identity, which says that the player who gets to 6 agenda points first wins the game. This means that our opponent is very likely running a 3 point agenda suite, meaning that all their agendas are 3 pointers. The ramification of that is, they only need 2 agendas to win. This is very scary because they could possibly win before we are completely set up and ready to challenge their servers. Thankfully for us, we begin with an Omakua in hand. This is the magic card that you need along with 419 in order to start sieging the servers. Our opponent installs a naked remote and denies the expose, so we do not know what's in server 1. Now we could go run check it, uh, run check it, we could go run it and check it. It's very likely to be a snare given the way my opponent is playing. Uh, in fact, my opponent is playing very, very cockily, I should say, because I can easily threaten a diversion of funds, even a double diversion without any ice on HQ. But um, clearly, they show that uh, I show that I don't have any diversions in hand. Instead, I just set up my Omakua and take a few credits. It's not a very fast start, but I don't really have much uh, of value in my hand outside of the career fairs, which are kind of useless without daily casts or Earthrise hotels. My opponent install advances, and I can't really contest the ice at this point, so instead I go farming for some Omakua counters, getting an Aesop's Pawn Shop off the Paragon Trigger. So I'm going to keep that on the top of my deck as it is one of my main ways of making money. But not going to play it just yet, I'm only on 2 credits and I have nothing to sell. So this is a key thing about playing uh, Netrunner. You don't really play cards until you are ready to use them unless you have a good reason to play them. Like for example, if you are afraid of net damage, uh, sniping those cards from your hand, you should play them. Otherwise, in this case, I'm more worried about my opponent getting to 6 points. So I'll only play the Aesops when I have cards that uh, I can sell to Aesops. Now my opponent install advances again, uh, revealing that their first install advance was an NGO front. We run R&D here, uh, and we trigger Paragon to see crowdfunding. Uh, this is a card I need um, again, because I need some money and card draw, so we are going to draw into it and we are going to play it. We also draw into our fairy, which is our one time breaker against sentries, could be useful this matchup. Um, you'll notice that I made a mistake, I should have ran HQ on my very first run instead of R&D because the card in the remote is almost certainly an agenda. So had I run HQ, I would have seen the agenda. So you always see HQ first before uh, diverting to R&D, this was a mistake I made. Now I'm going to run HQ here to try to figure out what my opponent's eyes are. Um, I'm going to see Breach Dome from H HQ which trashes the Aesops from my hand and the one card mill from the Breach Dome actually mills the deuces while I was about to draw a Paragon. So that's really annoying. Two very high value cards now in the trash. Uh, that is a very very good Breach Dome there. Um, from my R&D runs, I however do know that my opponent has been drawing to DNA Tracker and Eli 1.0. So the two outer eyes that you see, one on R&D and the outermost eyes on the remote, one of them's an Eli, the other one's a DNA Tracker almost certainly. So it's quite important to keep that in mind um, as my opponent now places a third piece of ice, this time on HQ, and denies the expose. So I don't know what that is either. My opponent being very rich can afford to take this credit denial and in turn deny me the key information I need. I can't really run central safely. There could be a DNA tracker waiting for me. So all I can do is to install my key cards like Aesop, uh, sorry, Fairy and the R&D interface, the topic of today's successful demo, will be hitting the table shortly as well. But I can't run any servers. 
All servers have ice that are threatening, and Archives has the breach dome, making it fruitless to run it for Omakua counters. As my opponent scores the Obokata, getting exactly halfway to victory. This is a very scary prospect. They have enough money to score the next agenda they draw. So I have to drop the R&D interface here. You'll notice I'm not running R&D because there's a high chance it's a DNA tracker on R&D, having seen the DNA tracker in Eli from my R&D runs. Instead, I'm going to run HQ, and my opponent shows the Cortex lock that I can break with Fairy. If I don't do this, I'll take 3 net damage and my hand is too valuable for that right now. I'm going to access the 1 card from the hand, uh, seeing falsified credentials on the top of my deck. I'm going to keep it there with Paragon and I access an Obo Carter. I have to steal it here because if I don't, they will jam it in the remote next turn where it's much harder to fetch. So that's a very key denial and puts us at 3 points apiece. One more agenda for me and I win the game too. This is a very fast paced game as my opponent continues installing ice and denying me the expose. I do not know what's on R&D now and my R&D interface cannot go to work. Um, also another ice on HQ means that I can't uh, run into HQ that freely. So it seems like I'm getting locked out here. My Omakua is halfway charged up. I want it to be on 6 virus counters just as I want to be on 6 agenda points but there's no way to get Omakua counters here. I'll just have to blind falsified credential, sorry, blind siphon, blind diversion of funds in here, and my opponent ends the round with a Kakugo, except that they don't because Kakugo is only one strength. Omakua breaks that, and Cortex Lock is easily broken with my fairy. So that's my second fairy, I think. So we get the siphon off. This is huge because this puts my opponent down to seven credits. Now, they're still really rich. After one diversion of funds and all the 419 triggers denied, they're still on 7 credits, which is amazing. But this means that R&D is now ripe for the picking. Because they are one credit short of resing that key DNA tracker, I can run R&D safely knowing that that cannot hit me. Um, so I'm, I don't have to worry about a non or DNA tracker, Jinteki's too dangerous ice. So I get the double access on R&D, I see no agendas, but more importantly, I get to charge my Omakua. I run again to get another Omakua counter even though I'm not going to see any fresh cards, but for a second reason. By making this run, this is the third run I've made this turn, crowdfunding comes back into play and gives me 3 credits and a card over my next few turns. So this is a very powerful combo that you can run with this deck and with most criminal decks for that matter. Clicks 1 and 2 diversion, clicks 3 and 4 run R&D. That is a total of 3 runs. And you can see that R&D interface just amplifies the amount of value I get out of those R&D runs. Not only am I gaining 2 Omakua counters and a crowdfunding, I'm also getting double access with R&D interface. So that's really sweet. My opponent doesn't further shore up HQ, which allows me to land my second siphon, putting them down to 4 credits. So this is really amazing. Even though I'm losing cards to Kakugo, I'm more than happy to take the money here put them down to 5 credits, render them unable to res the DNA tracker on R&D at all. Right? It's pretty clear at this point that they had 7 credits, they're not resing anything on R&D, so the innermost ice must be a DNA tracker. Um, they finally decide to res the outermost Kakugo, which I happily um, break. Um, I'm gonna lose some cards from my hand here. Katie Jones hits the bin, but that's completely fine, because we're gonna see another 2 cards. We're just going to see Kakugo and IPO. So it's really nice seeing the IPO on the deck, knowing that they can't possibly play it when they're so poor. Um, <clears throat> yep, so things are going pretty well. Uh, my opponent got a very good head start, but the two diversion of funds really swung things in my favor. However, I'm running low on cards, so I'm going to get the uh, Earthrise Hotel going here. I saw that off the top of Paragon. So I know that that's going to come my way, and now my opponent's just slowly clicking for credits the hard way so that they can play IPO the next turn. So this is the other amazing thing about R&D interface. You don't have to run R&D every turn to ensure the R&D lock. R&D lock is a concept that basically means locking the top card of their R&D such that they never draw into agendas. Because every agenda that they try to draw off R&D is instead accessed by you. Right? If you run R&D frequently enough, in fact, if you run R&D every turn to see the topmost card, um, well, the corp draws that card during the mandatory draw, they won't see any agendas because any agendas that they would have drawn will, be have, will have been stolen by you instead. With R&D interface, you can afford to run t half as often and still maintain R&D lock. As you see here, I'm going to access two fresh cards, an Embolus and a Celebrity Gift. 
Um, so yeah, by, by doing so, I'm able to trash the Ambolas and they draw the celebrity gifts so I know they don't have any agendas in hand just yet because <clears throat> I managed to see lots of cards on R&D. Two cards in this case is more than enough. Um, for them to break the R&D lock, that is to say to draw agendas off the top of R&D, they actually have to spend clicks drawing, which they can't afford to right now because they're poor. I siphoned them down and now they have to deal with this all-encompassing breaker that's Ormacor. So they were forced to spend that one turn purging my Ormacor. That sets them their tempo back big time. And, you know, for me, it's not a big loss at all because now it is uh, the phase where I start transitioning to using my regular breakers. I've already set up the Corroder just for this purpose. Knowing that I'm up against a one-strength Kakugo, having Corroder out is really nice to have. And this means that I can, I'm able to use Deuces Wild here, get the Expose and start charging up my Omakua up to strength again. You'll notice that I jack out here, or rather let the Kakugo end the run, because I realize I can't really afford to run through my opponent's Cortex Lock on HQ. So the uh, Deuces Wild run was not very useful, but that's fine. Um, the most important part was getting the Expose to start charging up our Omakua. <clears throat> As we don't have our full breaker suite yet, having the threat of an Omakua is really nice and I still have the falsified credentials in my hand uh, so that I can expose my opponent's remotes if need be. Speaking of uh, exposing remotes, my opponent installs here and double advances. Oh, preventing the expose here. So that's... Uh, that yeah, that is basically signaling. Um, it's, it's my time to start using falsified credentials to see what the card is. Given how desperate my opponent is and how aggressive they are with install double advancing, right after my armor core got purged, I figured that had to be agenda. So I'm gonna falsify credentials, naming agenda, and I see the future perfect. Perfect. They are only on six credits. I all I need to do is to break end the run code gates. I'm not worried about. Barriers because I've corroded out. I'm not worried about sentries because, um, you know, sentries are expensive to rest. So I'm gonna get my airbag nail out here to deal with Enderan code gates. But then I realize special order isn't offering me the option to get my one off airbag nail from my deck out. Turns out I drew it with Earthrise Hotel and completely missed it. So the airbag nail was in my hand all along, and I was looking, I was searching through my bin trying to see where did my airbag nail go? Did it get milled by Breach Dome? I don't know. Couldn't figure it out. Took me long enough um, to realize that it was in my hand after all. Not gonna do a taxi backsies here because I, I think I can still get through. Um, I'm just gonna install the airbag nail after using special order on a fairy needlessly. And then last click run here to steal the future perfect. This is gonna be the final run of the game. Either I make it in or I don't, someone's gonna win either way due to my opponent's ID ability. Six points wins you the game. So I know the outer eyes on server two is almost certainly Eli, given what I saw of R&D, and yes it is. This is easily broken with Corroda. This is why I prepared the Corroda in advance. And we move on in and my opponent isn't really able to put up a sufficient defense. Cortex Nox here um, does take out some cards from my hand, but that's irrelevant when I can steal the winning agenda. I told my opponent after that, however, if had, that had been an Obo Carter, I would have lost the game instead because I didn't have the four cards to steal it. So the game actually ended up being pretty close. So, what did R&D Interface do for us that game? And that's a very good question. Because on the surface of it, it seems like it allowed us to see maybe two or three extra cards throughout the course of the entire game of R&D. That's about it. None of which were agendas even, right? Um, the first Obokata I stole was from HQ. The second agenda was contested off the remote. Was R&D interface really a card to be triumph here? Well, let's look at it this way. R&D interface is a card that increases the value of running R&D. Right? Previously, Corpse could get away with just a single taxing ice on R&D um, because it just isn't worth it to pay 6 or more credits just to get a single access of r and I'm thinking of ice like DNA Tracker and Fairchild 3. These uh, require typically 6 credits to break with your typical code gate breakers. r and interface completely changes the equation because now you can get double the value for paying the same price. Just pay the same amount of money to get past that DNA Tracker or Fairchild 3 and you get double the reward. And this means that for run-based decks, not we don't have to keep uh, you know, focusing on HQ or in empty archives. Now, R&D becomes a viable attack target, and you saw how we abused that this game. 
right? We made our opponent broke and then we went for broke on R&D, getting so much value out of R&D runs, not only triggering Paragon, crowdfunding, um, or McCoy, but also getting multiple accesses of R&D. This forces the court to invest more defenses on R&D, ice which would usually go to HQ to protect against siphons or put, uh, go on the remote to protect uh, the future perfect of course. Um, the other option which my opponent opted for because their eyes were uh, relatively more flimsy, it being a rushier deck, was to play more loosely. My opponent went for the install double advance play on the future perfect even though they didn't really have the eyes to protect it. Eli into Cortex Lock was uh, very easy to get through. Even without any additional breakers, I was easily able to get through that. But they had to chance it there because they knew that they had no shot at the game if they dragged it out. Uh, because we were both on match point and I had the R&D interface. R&D interface means that the chance of me winning off an R&D run if I feel like attacking R&D on a whim is so much higher because getting two accesses instead of one, um, you know, more than doubles the chance of you seeing an agenda off the top of R&D. So um, instead of chancing it off R&D, and you know getting locked out of agendas themselves because if i steal an agenda they can't draw it I, I mean the game would end anyway but more importantly you know uh my opponent decided to take the game in their own hands and install double advance in the remote denying the expose um and yeah the falsified credentials allowed me to sneak in uh you know get uh confirmed that running that remote was the correct decision so yeah, um that's the power of r and interface it's the subtle pressure on the court to do something uh, at the end of the game, I chatted with my opponent and they said yes, um, they, they had to push the future perfect through there even though they, it was a complete bluff because they simply couldn't risk the R&D digs, right? If you compare R&D interface to the other uh, R&D pressure cards prior to system core, they are all rather uh, transient, I should say. The Maker's Eye is just a one-use event. You can run three copies of it in your deck, but you know every time you play one, uh, your opponent, the court can figure that you probably won't have the next one for some time and yeah, uh, it's just not sustained pressure on R&D uh, that you can maintain over the course of the game. They can simply just drag you through R&D time and again, weather the storm and then build up sufficient defenses to close out the game. Same thing with the turning wheel, even though it stays on your board for the entire game, assuming it doesn't get trashed, um, uh, charging it up is slow, it takes time and uh, you know, it requires continuous investment in the form of clicks spent running. You need to spend clicks charging up the turning wheel, and these are clicks that can be spent instead gaining money. So if you're spending your clicks charging the turning wheel instead of setting up a good credit level, your the opponent court can simply just score in a remote, and you can't really contest it. Indexing is the premier R&D card of uh, pressure card of choice prior to R&D interface becoming a thing simply because it maintains R&D lock in a way that none of these other cards do. Indexing allows you to see the top 5 cards of your opponent's deck. This effectively means that the next 5 cards that the corp draws are not going to be agendas and that's a big deal because it buys you the 2 or 3 turns you need to set up your board state so that you can control the remote and if the corp decides to drag the game out some more, you have a bot state that can challenge R&D with a second indexing as well. This is why indexing was the prime, the premier card, R&D card of choice uh, for the most part uh, in competitive play, simply because it assured you that the corp was not going to draw into agendas anytime soon. R&D interface serves the exact same purpose, um, but comes with a bonus that, you know, unlike indexing, it's not one-off. So that's the benefit there. The drawback, of course, being that you have to pay 4 credits up front, which is a pretty expensive price to pay. Right, now let's talk about combos. Um, R&D interface obviously combos with R&D accesses, cards that allow you to access R&D outside the normal structure of making a run on R&D. Omar Kyung allows you to get R&D interface benefits even though you're running on archives, same thing with Divide and Conquer. Mind's Eye on the other hand, um, its ability where you use 3 hosted power counters to access the top card of R&D that is boosted by R&D interface as well. Another Rain and Reverie card that's boosted by R&D interface is Psych Mike, the card that pays you out the more cards you access from R&D. R&D interface is expensive to install, but you can uh, recoup your losses with Psych Mike somewhat. Finally, R&D interface also synergizes with itself. This is something that uh, bears mentioning. I did not get to showcase it this game, 
but R&D interface does stack with itself because it's not unique. And the more R&D interfaces you have, the uh, you know the greater an inevitability you pose to the corp. Because when you get to the point where every R&D run nets you three or four fresh accesses, you've basically won the game um, as long as you can get into R&D. This is because uh, you can set up a, you know, a board state where all you need to do is to run R&D every three or four turns and spend the remainder of your clicks during those three or four turns just taking money. Um, so yeah, you just r rinse and repeat until you finally see an agenda of R&D. There's really nothing much the corp can do against that. Um, being a hardware or an interface isn't really susceptible to being trashed by tags and um, yeah it's just really permanent in that sense which is why um, R&D's inter uh, interfaces introduction back into the meta game isn't without controversy. That being said in the current meta game corps are very fast with Rashidas and NGOs they can become really rich as I mentioned my opponent was playing a very filthy rich corp deck that was able to pay through two siphons and all the 419 triggers and still had enough money to actually threaten game point at the end of it. My opponent was really rich and yeah corps are just really rich nowadays so they can score much faster than they used to be able to Chances are, by the time you have stacked your R&D interfaces, the corp has already scored 20,000 agenda points. So it's not really a strategy you want to build around, but it allows you to pose that late game inevitability against slow corps. So that's something to keep in mind both as the runner and as the corp. R&D interface is a very powerful card, uh, one which you know has dominated the meta game for quite a bit of Netrunner's history if you look uh, way back. Um, and it, it should be quite refreshing to see how it's being played in the current meta game. What are your experiences with R&D interface? Have you tried it out in Anarch? I'll be, in, I'll be excited to hear about what you have to say, and I'll be sure to play this card a bit more as we move along in this new format. Speaking of which, this being my very first video since System Core, as in uh, using the System Core meta, I hope uh, this is content that you enjoy. Um, stand, you know, uh, talking about uh, old cards in the standard format. Um, all any and all comments and suggestions are appreciated. In the meantime, as always, thanks for watching and happy net running. See you next time. Goodbye.